It is now 7 p.m. and I am reconvening to open session and calling to order the regular Board of Education meeting for Indian Prairie School District 204 on Monday, February 26, 2024. Michelle, will you please call the roll? Ms. Donahue? Here. Ms. Deming? Present. Ms. Jane? Here. Mr. Karubas? Here. Mr. Rising? Here. Ms. Fosdick? And Ms. Gintz? Here. We have a quorum. Ms. Deming, will you lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? Pledge of Allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, we have several board salutes. Um, Ms. Gentz. Matea Valley JV Dance Team State Champions. The board salutes the Matea Valley JV Dance Team who won the Illinois Drill Team Association State Championship in the JV1 Hip Hop Division. The varsity team had a top 10 finish and earned their highest score in Matea Valley's history. Congratulations to the coaches and team on this great achievement. Illinois PTA Outstanding Teacher of the Year. The board salutes Wabonzi Valley Fine Arts Department Chair and Band Teacher Mark Duker. Mr. Duker, you can wave. <laughs> <laughs> Who was named the Illinois PTA Outstanding Teacher of the Year. The award recognizes educators who have demonstrated a positive impact with their PTA, students, and the learning community. Congratulations, Mr. Duker. We're going to get a picture now or after all of them? Let's do after. Yeah, let's do after. Okay. Um, Ms. Dumming. 2024 Henry Cowherd Scholarship winners. Is your thing up? Okay. Sorry. The board salutes Matea Valley Senior Jada Lewis and Wabonzi Valley Senior Tyler Threat for receiving a 2024 Henry Cowherd Scholarship from the Aurora African American Heritage Advisory Board. Scholarship recipients have made a commitment to volunteerism, have high academic excellence, and seek to use their education to advance the African American community. Congratulations, Jada and Tyler. <laughs> You had, yeah, okay, you had another one, right? <laughs> 2024 Far West Suburbs Teacher of the Year. The board salutes Georgetown Elementary fifth grade teacher, Dr. Rachel Mahmood. <laughs> it was named the Illinois State Board of Education 2024 Far West Suburbs Teacher of the Year. Dr. Mahmood is one of 15 finalists for Illinois Teacher of the Year. Since 1970, the Illinois State Board of Education has sponsored the award to honor educators who have made a significant contribution to our state's public and non-public elementary and secondary schools. Congratulations, Dr. Mahmood. Ms. Jane. Matia Valley Individual Speech State Champion. The board salutes Matia Valley Senior Sidi Nayakanti for achieving top honors in the informative speech category, speaking category at the Illinois High School Association State Final. Congratulations, Siri, for a job well done. <laughs> Nico Valley Speech Team wins state. The board salutes the Nico Valley speech team on their state championship title. Individual state champions were senior April Zhang in the extemporaneous and oratory group, senior Anurag Ghosh for a special occasion speaking, and senior Avinish Rajan in the prose category. Congratulations for a job well done. Mr. Rising. District 204 students excel in the middle school robotics tournament. The board salutes District 204 middle school students and staff who participated in the robotics tournament 
at Fisher Middle School on Saturday, February 3rd, as well as Director of Innovation and Instructional Leadership, Brian Giovannini, for serving as a term tournament organizer. Congratulations to Gregory Team C and Hill Team D, which captured the Tournament Championship Award. Crone Team B and Hill, Hill Team F were the tournament finalists, and Skills Champion went to Hill Team D. Uh, Gregory Gamma Squad was the second place champion, and the overall excellence winner was Gregory Team Epsilon. The middle school excellence winners were Hill Team E, Crone Team C, Fisher 209T, Skull and Delta, and Still Team 3. Congratulations to all the robotics teams, and thank you to Indian Prairie Educational Foundation for supporting this robotics tournament experience. <laughs> Granger Educator receives award of special recognition. Is Matt Walsh here? No. Uh, uh, the board salutes Granger bilingual teacher Matt Walsh for receiving the Illinois State Board of Education's 2024 award of special recognition. The Educator Recognition Program acknowledges and appreciates Illinois' amazing teachers, administrators, support staff, and community members who work to make a positive impact in their schools. Congratulations, Matt, on receiving this prestigious award. So I'd like to have another round of applause for all of those amazing awards and uh, accomplishments. And and we'd like to give a special recognition for our two teachers that got these amazing recognitions tonight. So we'll start with Mr. Duk Ducker, if you could come up. And we're going to get a picture. If you want to say a couple words of wisdom to us. <laughs> or no. Uh, on the way there, be a seat. <laughs> uh, I, I, if I were going to say something in all seriousness, I would just say, um, uh, what I said at Wabonzi when they delivered this was that this feels a little fraudulent because I teach two periods a day and I'm a department chair the rest of the day. But uh, in talking with the PTA, this is really a community award. Um, and what I mean by that is that I think it speaks to the community we have at Wabonzi, really. And I'm the person they happen to have chosen to represent that. But we have such a great place to teach and um, a great community of families to, to work with. And um, my job. Um, requirement is to get out there and share what our students are doing more than the average teacher. So I think really that's what that recognition was. I'm, I'm very appreciative of it, um, but I'm just doing the job that I was asked to do. So it's my pleasure. And um, Rachel Mahmood, I would like you to come up also and say a few words and uh, get a picture for your great accomplishment also. Hello, thank you. Um, I just wanna say that 20 years ago, I walked into District 204 for the very first time in this room right here. I sat at my first Parent Diversity Advisory Council meeting um, with Sandra Charles and Gerald Bloodsaw and Mike Razak and Adrian Morgan and Donna Crawford. And I was searching for belonging in school, something I never felt as a student. And I had the spark to do something with that and to affect education in some way. And I'm just so incredibly grateful for every opportunity that District 204 has provided for having a school board and superintendents that support the equity work, culturally responsive teaching and belonging, for working in two amazing buildings with great colleagues at Brookdale, my colleagues at Georgetown who came out to support me and all the wonderful administrators that I've met and just forever changed by like 500 plus students who I'm just so incredibly lucky to wake up every day and do a job that I love, that I'm passionate about 
and just be surrounded with unconditional love from kids. And I'm excited about these next steps and, you know, just amplifying and elevating the wonderful things we're doing in 204 at the state level and sharing just how amazing our district is. Thank you. Okay, now we will have our student representative report from. Uh, oh, okay. Oh, we're going to give out the speech awards. Oh, okay. All right. Are you going to go up to the microphone? Okay. You want me to come over there? Do you need help? Yeah, that would be great. So we have our speech awards for the team state champions. Congratulations, guys, on the uh, well, well done. Uh, how many want to do this? If you can call them out, okay. and then I'll hand, then it, to hand it to you. Yeah, so it'll be good. Alyssa Schroth. Do you, want, do you want them on camera? Yeah. Anurag Ghosh. <laughs> Mei Ling Soon. <laughs> Avinish Tyagarajan. April Zhang. <laughs> Emily Fritz. <laughs> Jen Arnett. <laughs> Kevin Hill. Amanda McDonald. I don't think Coach is here. Coach Hemant Mehta. Don't think he's here. So we want to thank you guys tremendously. Congratulations. We want to all come yeah, up I think we should.
you should have had all of them come and give a speech while they <laughs> <laughs> But they would put us all to shame, wouldn't they? Yeah. Uh, okay. Now it's time for the student representative report by Rishda Amsaraj from Matia Valley. Hello. All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Vishwant Amsaraj, and I'm the executive board representative for Matia Valley High School, and it's a pleasure for me to be here with you all today. First, let's begin with some general updates. We celebrated our 400 plus IP scholars on Wednesday, February 21st, and we're looking forward to hosting the PTS conferences this coming Thursday on the 29th. Next up, Fine Arts. February started with our orchestra show, and it was a great event led by Coach Williams and our dancers. We hosted Winter Scenes the second weekend of February, and it was composed of three different student-led, directed, written, and active performances. It was a very moving, powerful, and amazing show. The Multicultural Fair was on Friday the 23rd, with six plus of our cultural groups contributing to the celebration. Unity and Excellence hosted a showcase for Black History Month on Friday the 23rd as well. The speech team took ninth in state with our very first state champion in Matia Valley speech team history, Siri Nayakanti, in informative speaking. So great job, Mustang. 11 BPA students went to states this weekend with myself and four other qual students qualifying for nationals. Congratulations. 45 DECA students go to um, states this weekend to compete at the state level. Best of luck to all that are competing. Matia, Niqua, and Wabanzi bands perform for each other and receive the clinic at Matia Valley on President's Day. The Illinois State University when Symphony joined us for a special performance in the middle of the day. Matia Valley Chamber Strings performed in a side-by-side -side concert with the new Philharmonic Orchestra featuring all of the music from John Williams at the Cod Mag Center on January 19th and 20th. Last but not least, athletics. Girls bowling made it to sectionals, boys bowler made it to sectionals, wrestling had some alternates advance in both boys and girls, dance JV won IDTA at state, and additionally, Matia Valley High School hosted the swim sectionals and boys basketball regionals with spring sports starting Monday. Overall, we've had a very successful season with numerous qualifications, awards, and we're looking to see what more our amazing Mustangs can do. So many great things happening across the board, and this is just a snapshot of Matia Valley's success and potential. That's all for the February board report. Thank you for your time, stay safe, and as always, go, go Mustangs. Okay, it is now time for public comment and 60 minutes is allowed. Each person is limited to three minutes. When addressing the board, we ask that you respect the confidentiality and the safety of our students and school district personnel. We also ask that those addressing the board be cognizant that this is an open meeting and is available to all age groups and as such, ask that you consider who the audience members are this evening and keep comments age appropriate. Public comment represents the voice and opinion of the speaker. There will be no feedback from the board members during the meeting, but follow-up will be provided by an administrator as appropriate. Although this is not required, it is helpful for the board to know whether the comments and concerns we hear are being raised by residents, so we ask that you state if you live in the district and if you currently have children in our schools. We have two speakers tonight. First is Alicia Smith. Hello, <clears throat> I live in the Gombert neighborhood. I taught at Georgetown and Kendall, and I attended Gregory and Wabonzi. 204 states that you are committed to equity. 204 does not have equity in busing. The district's policy is that students who live less than 1.5 miles from their school are not eligible for busing transportation. Yet in practice, this is not occurring. The district picks and chooses who they grant busing to. There are neighborhoods that are less than 1.5 miles that the district chooses to bus and other neighborhoods whom they deny busing. In the past year and a half, you have stated that Stonebridge, White Eagle, and Eagle Point and the Gombert, Georgetown, and McCarty neighborhoods have a safe route to school. Those routes consist of walking alongside or crossing Ogden Road, or sorry, Ogden Avenue, Eola Road, and Montgomery Road. You all insist that walking alongside or crossing Ogden Avenue, Eola Road, and Montgomery Road is safe for 6th through 12th graders. The Georgetown neighborhood has to cross the busiest Walker intersection in the district to attend Wabonzi. Yet neither Georgetown's or McCarty's route has been reviewed for safety since they started walking to Wabonzi over 30 years ago. Meanwhile, other high schoolers with a much safer walk are being bused. 
Many community members have lived experience of utilizing these walkways as a pedestrian or as a cyclist. We have told you repeatedly these routes are not safe. We have mentioned that it will be dark outside when students are utilizing these routes or that they are not cleared of snow. District 204 should be advocating for the safety of its students with the city of Aurora and with the state. 204 has experienced the grief of losing students and a staff member. Within a 1.5 radius, mile radius of Obanzi Valley High School, there are six District 204 schools, six. There is also a community center with a library and gym frequented by students, not to mention area fast food restaurants and stores. It should be clear to motorists when they enter this area that there are pedestrians and cyclists, many of whom are not adults. 204 should be advocating for no left turn signals on Eola at the intersection of Ogden and Eola. 204 should be advocating for no turn on right signals for all of the intersections students may utilize on their routes to school. 204 should be advocating for sidewalks on the south side of Ogden, away from the entrance and exits to gas stations and strip malls. 204 should be advocating for a better pedestrian crossing from Fisher to the McDonald's and Starbucks frequented by students. You deny students busing eligibility. Instead, you should be making sure that the routes are as safe as possible. They are not safe with multiple accidents occurring on these routes. We as community members and parents are advocating as individuals, but 204 is an educational system. You should be using your power as a system to advocate for safety for your students. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Samantha Bamberger. Hi. Um, I'm a mother of two who's moved to the district about three years ago in order to get the high quality education that my children are going to be blessed to receive. But by, beyond the education itself, there's the question of safety and security that's ever present. Our schools have the power to push our local representatives to do more, particularly when it comes to the safety of our children. The car first mentality that is surrounding this area is dangerous for pedestrians and cyclists, therefore our children. As I brought up repeatedly at various Aurora Council and committee meetings, kids don't drive. It seems really obvious until you explain they're always going to walk and bike, and I'm always going to do it with them because I love it. I would like to see District 204 be the powerful advocate that it can be to insist on infrastructure that helps support these precious lives that it mentors for years on end. The main concern that I have is bordered by McCoy, Eola, Keating, and the railroad tracks. This community is less than three miles long with six schools, including four elementary schools, a middle school, and a high school. The vast majority of these students are not eligible for busing according to the transportation plan and are therefore forced to walk or bike or find alternative rides. This area has the library, community center, parks, stores, and restaurants. And we want to be able to use our community to the fullest extent possible as families. So there's been numerous accidents in this area, including failed accidents. Um, I think that would be cause for concern enough for the district to be able to support local representatives to push for more safety. I've been working with other community members and trying to articulate various steps that the local community could take that you could also support, including no turn on red signals, particularly at Odd and Eola, um, but also as well as at Montgomery and Long Grove. Uh, we've seen that these intersections are cause for concern. Some of these areas, the signs say not to cross while pedestrians and cyclists are present, but those turn signals don't go on. If a child could press them to indicate that they're present, I cannot tell you the number of times I've had a car try to run me and my four-year-old over in those areas. Next to the intersection at Odd and Eola is one of the busiest in our communities, but also has two schools that are not even marked as school zones that they get to walk through every day. Even the local police department is aware of these concerns and waves them off to me, and then is surprised when something happens to these children. So I just came here to say, I hope that you support us in our safety measures. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we move to our consent agenda and superintendent report. We will start with the superintendent report, Dr. Talley. Thank you, Ms. Donahue, members of the Board of Education, Indian Prairie community. I start my comments tonight with sad news. Mr. Lawrence Curtin, a first student bus driver, passed away on Tuesday, February 20th, after he had completed his bus run. He joined first student in August 2023 
and was assigned bus routes in October of 2023. He was 50 years old. I ask that we take a moment of silence in honor of Mr. Curtin. Thank you. Over the past few weeks and tonight, some staff members in our district have been recognized for their work. We have done some board salutes. However, I'd like to take a moment to remind our community about these outstanding educators. Mr. Al Davenport has been um, identified as the DuPage County Middle School Principal of the Year. Ms. Erin Rodriguez, DuPage County Elementary School Principal of the Year. Dr. Rachel Mahmood, Far West Suburbs Teacher of the Year and candidate for Illinois Teacher of the Year. And she's one of the first that we've had in Indian Prairie that's going for that one in recent history. Doc, uh, Mr. Mark Duker, uh, Illinois PTA's Teacher of the Year, and Mr. Matt Walsh, ISBE Award for Special Recognition. I congratulate these people collectively and individually for all they have done to earn their awards. Our district should be honored that these educators have been given these awards. It reflects positively on our district and the hard work that these people do individually and with each other. Our children are all the better because these educators are here working in our district and working with our children. In a recently published national magazine called School Transportation News, our transportation program and first student were spotlighted in an article about our use of technology that enhances the transportation program by making it more effective and efficient. We are very proud of the work of our transportation team led by Mr. Ron Johnson and supported by Alicia Clayton, as well as our partnership with first student. As I said at the last Board of Ed meeting, March 19th is an election primary day. Schools will be uh, closed because of the polling that will take place in schools. We will have an e-learning day that is synchronous, therefore different from the e-learning days we had earlier this year. More information will be going home to families about the schedule for that day. On Saturday, March 9th, the district is having its second annual mental health symposium, the reason we are all wearing our shirts. Events have been created for both adults and students. This event will be an opportunity for our community to learn more about how to support yourselves, your children, and your community on the mental health journey we are all, are, are all on. We are very happy that West Aurora will be part of this work with us. You can find more information at our website, and Dr. Daryl Eccles, retired principal of Matia, is presenting as one of the presenters. And finally, before I turn the meeting back over to the Board of Ed, I would like to request that the Board of Ed approve the appointment of Ms. Michelle Heben Street as principal of Patterson Elementary School, effective July 1, 2024, to replace Ms. Michelle Frost, who's retiring. Ms. Heben Street is currently a student service coordinator at Owen Elementary. Before her role, that she worked at Patterson as a, a student service coordinator and was an interventionist at Collishaw as well as the classroom teacher. And she began her career in, at Bram. And this is the first time I think we've ever had a mascot come <laughs> present for this ceremony. I'll turn it back to Ms. Donahue. Uh. Yes, how exciting. Um, I need a motion to approve Michelle Haven Street as principal at Patterson Elementary School as presented. Move that the Board of Education approve Michelle Haven Street as the principal of Patterson Elementary School as presented. I second. Any discussion? Michelle, will you please call the roll? Oh, wait, we should have discussion. Can, well, no, go ahead. We should vote first. Sorry. Uh -huh. <laughs> Mr. Rising? Yes. Ms. Jane? Yes. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Ms. Deming? Aye. Ms. Gintz? Yes. And Ms. Donahue? Yes. The motion passes. Congratulations. <laughs>
like for seven or eight years and had a variety of experiences and I'm thankful to be from the Bronx my entire school family. I'm thankful for the Board of Education for this opportunity. Also for all of the staff, the families, the students that I've worked with who have helped me get to where I am today. And this is Bronx and Craig. Okay. With the mask on. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You got to do it with yeah, the mask. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, new picture of the prairie dog. Look at a picture up oh. here. Yeah, we want a picture. Okay. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And the prairie, prairie dog. dog. Family's like, no. Okay. Yeah, help the prairie dog. She can't see. I now need a, a motion and a second for consent agenda items E through N. I move for the approval of consent agenda items E through, is it N? N. 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 Second. Any discussion? Okay, Michelle, will you please call the roll? Ms. Deming? Aye. Mr. Rising? Aye. Ms. Gintz? Yes. Ms. Jane? Um, Ms. Donahue? Yes. Yes. And Mr. Karubas? Yes. The motion passes. All right. Next, we move to our action items. Uh, approval of the Memorandum of Understanding with Indian Prairie Education Association. I need a motion to approve the memorandum between Indian Prairie Education Association and Indian Prairie School District Board of Education. I move that the Board of Education approve the Memorandum of Understanding between the Indian Prairie Educational Association and the Indian Prairie School District Board of Education as presented. Second. Any discussion? Should we say what this is for? Yes. Yes. This allows for us to move the uh, parent-teacher conferences. It is currently listed as happening at a certain time in November and the contract, and this would allow for us to move it forward to another date uh, for, for uh, as we study this move. And, and we are moving it because we got input from parents and staff that it would be more beneficial to have it at a different time than what's specified or date than what's in the contract. So that's what this will provide us. So um, Michelle, will you please call the roll? Mr. Rising? Yes. Ms. Gintz? Yes. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Ms. Donahue? Yes. Ms. Jane? Yes. And am I done? <laughs> I think I'm done. Ms. Deming. Ms. Deming. Hi. Just the VP. <laughs> Thank you. The motion passes. Okay. <laughs> no, I need a motion to approve the 2025 2026 school calendar as presented. I make a motion to approve the school calendar. Um, let's see, the 2025 2026 school calendar as presented. Second. Any discussion? Um, yeah, I, I 
think it's well done. I think it it bears mentioning again. I know you just did with the teacher conferences, but you know this is a cal calendar options that were looked at across the district. Um, it was presented in front of all the PTAs and IPPC. It was um, <coughs> the teachers and staff voted on this and. Um, the overwhelming choice was the option that we're going with tonight from both parents and staff members. So I just thought we should mention that. Okay. Mm -hmm. I, I do have, um, as we move forward with uh, school calendars, um, I wonder whether there's the opportunity for us to potentially look at uh, having multiple school calendars presented. Um, so in other words, we're doing the 25-26 one. Is it possible for us to look at 25-26 in the future, for example, and 26-27, just, just from the standpoint of uh, planning, not only district planning, but uh, uh, parental and, and family planning? I'm going to have Mr. Hillman come forward. He, in, in addition to being middle school um, assistant soup, he also does the calendar. So generally, the district has tried to provide a two-year in advance rolling calendar. So we have tried to have two sets of calendars that are always available for parents. However, this particular calendar, 2526, would be the last calendar that would be in avail under the current collective bargaining agreement. And because one of the um, discussion points that we envision happening is going to be around parent-teacher conferences and its placement, which is what the MOU allows us to be able to do, at this time, if we were to present a calendar for 26-27, it would be one that would undoubtedly have to be changed based on the collective bargaining agreement in which the calendar is specifically referenced inside the collective bargaining agreement. So we have tried during the um, years in which we have a stable contract, one that isn't ending, ending, to have calendars out two years in advance. But that would be the reason that I would, I mean, if you would like one, and I'm direct, and you as a collective group want me to prepare a calendar for that, we can, but know that we would most likely be coming back to you with revisions based on the, what, what, is, what comes out of the bargaining session. So in a, so in a perfect world, the next collective bargaining agreement at that point, we should be able to hopefully do 26, 27, 27, 28. Gotcha. To Susan's we will most point. certainly be presenting 26, 27. Um, if you would like both calendars for two, two consecutive years to be presented at the same time, that can be done. However, because the collective bargaining agreement and depending upon when that resolution becomes, it may be a little difficult to get you both at the same board meeting, mm -hmm. but we would be able to try to continue that two roll two years out of posting those calendars in advance. Yeah. Okay. okay. Thank you for the explanation. That makes mm -hmm. sense. So appreciate it. Not a problem. Thank you. All right. Any other discussion? Okay. Michelle, will you please call the roll? Miss Deming? Aye. Miss Gintz? Yes. Ms. Jane? Yes. Mr. Karubas? Yes. Mr. Rising? Yes. And Ms. Donahue? Yes. The motion passes. We now have a presentation from Ms. Trudy Ransom regarding Indian Prairie Education Foundation, our IPEF group. Good evening and thank you for having me back again. It's always great to be able to bring all of the wonderful things that the foundation is doing um, here in District 204 in partnership with uh, the Indian Prairie School District. I'm Dr. Trudy Ranson. I'm the Executive Director for the Indian Prairie Educational Foundation. Most people know us as IPEF. Um, I am proud and honored to be serving in my second year as the Executive Director. And um, people keep telling me this is gonna get easier, but butterflies still. <laughs> um, we are delighted um, that we are in partnership for 35 years with the district. We have provided more than $5.3 million towards District 204 programming since our founding in 1988. Um, and, but our goal has really not changed we are still trying to uh, support programs that enrich the lives of our students, our staff, the families, the community. 
bringing us all together to help improve the lives of um, District 204 students. We've been really busy since the last time I was here in September at the foundation. Um, we have been working on many programs, which some of which I have been uh, intend to talk about tonight. Um, since I saw you last, the foundation has contributed over $110,000 to the district in programs and supports. And um, tonight, I'd like to talk to you about some of these programs, um, followed by some upcoming events that we have going on. Um, I did not intend to put these in alphabetical order, but uh, I am going to start with the A plus award. <laughs> this is our 10th year for the A plus award. Teachers or staff are nominated by a member of the student, parent, or community. Um, these nominations come in, they are put in front of a committee. Uh, I'm not allowed to be on the committee because apparently I have to be neutral, but the committee decides uh, who wins every month. Uh, I read them all and I honestly don't know how they decide because all of these nominations are incredible. So far this year we have uh, given out four A plus award. Uh, our September award went to a kindergarten teacher at Graham Elementary October. We were delighted to be able to honor a school nurse which we have not done since 2016 so that was really fun. And then in November and again in January we uh, honored two elementary uh, fifth grade teachers at Patterson and Owen Elementary. Um, our next award is tomorrow, and it's always a secret, so no spoilers, but uh, we're getting a little off the elementary track here, and we are going to a middle school tomorrow. So stay tuned and see uh, who we're honoring. This person is a little outside our typical box, so I'm very excited about tomorrow's award. We also gave out uh, just shy of $10,000 in teacher innovation grants in the month of December. Uh, 9,995 was as close as I could get this year. Um, as you can see from the list up here, um, of the 32 applications, we funded 10. Um, these 10 grants are going to impact, are projected to impact somewhere around 4,100 students um, in our district. Since 1996, over one and a half million dollars have been uh, given by the foundation for teacher grants. Some of these programs are incredible. We're so excited to be able to have such a wonderful range, not only of building levels, but also of topics. We're doing everything from academic writing um, uh, to math, to um, shaking earthquake tables. I can't wait to see that at Springbrook, to be honest. Um, We're doing a little science, um, a little uh, social emotional learning. Um, and for the first time since 2016, we are giving a grant to the Prairie Children Preschool. So I was very excited to be able to help our, our, our young neighbors downstairs. Team IPEF celebrated its 10th year as a charity running event. Um, we had 295 runners wearing the signature team IPEF yellow uh, at our October um, race, including everybody who's sitting up here. So thank you very much for being a part of our team. Um, we had uh, all schools in the district represented by a team this year, plus the CEC here. So uh, we had a full, full house this year. One out of every 10 runners on the course on race day was wearing our signature yellow. So I can honestly say that I am incredibly proud of our community, our staff, our students, um, everybody, our parents, everybody who joined together to help us raise um, $94,646 this year. Um, this is the most money that we have, this is the highest total that we've raised since 2019. So we are thrilled to be able to raise this kind of money because as you can see, we returned 45,000 plus right back to our schools. Every runner for Team IPEF represents a school and half of the money that they raise goes straight back into that school. Um, I'd like to give a special shout out to Brookdale Elementary this year, who not only had our biggest team at 40 members strong, but raised over $9,000 as a team. 
Um, on my big check tour, you can see I, I included one of my pictures from my big check tour up here. Um, I was privileged to be able to give um, the folks over at Brookdale a check for $5,650. That's real money that they have um, to use at their discretion. All of the schools, the money that they get from Team IPEF uh, is used in whatever way that school needs the most. So I think it's a wonderful program and it's a win-win uh, for the foundation and for the district. I'd also like to congratulate Graham Elementary, who's down there in the lower left-hand corner of your screen, for their fantastic uh, Barbie pink theme this year for their Spirit Squad. We all saw them. They were fantastic, and they won our Spirit Squad competition this year and earned a little extra money for Graham Elementary. Even the Graham Falcon had a pink tutu on, so it was pretty, it was pretty fabulous. The holiday season uh, was a very busy one for all of us. We ran our Gifts of Gratitude program for the fourth year now. Um, this year we had 69 gifts that went to teachers and staff members at over 20 schools. This program is a fantastic way for parents and community members to say thank you to their teachers. They donate uh, to the foundation in that teacher's name and then the foundation gives them a certificate and a personalized letter from the donor and so we had a lot of wonderful messages that got to our teachers and staff right at the holiday season. Our holiday concerts were fantastic as always. IPEF is a huge supporter of the fine arts here in this district and have been. It was the reason we were founded um, and whether you went to collage, crystal, or prism, it didn't matter. Every single one of them was a fabulous tour de force of music and talent and uh, if you have not attended one of these in our district, I cannot recommend it enough. It is a fantastic experience. Also in the December, January timeline, we funded the Meet the Artist contest, or concert, which is at Wabansi Valley, where they bring in professional musicians to work with their uh, music students. And we also uh, helped to fund the Masterworks concert at Niqua Valley High School in January. Um, also, two very fine concerts, if you get the opportunity, they do run them every year. I added Kid Essentials to this slide because it feels like the holiday season is when we think most about giving back to some of our most vulnerable students and community members, although this program, this district program, is a year-round event because it is a year-round need here in our district. Um, the Kid Essentials program benefits over 5,600 students here in District 204 that are categorized as low income or homeless. It always surprises people when I tell them we have homeless students in our district. The last number I saw was 157. Um, and we support those students um, by providing them with things like school supplies, food, clothing, transportation, hygiene kits, med uh, medical um, appointments and more. Uh, whenever I get a, an email from the district and they say we need a little more help here or there, we are always happy to help them from, uh, from our foundation because these students are some of our most vulnerable and we want to make sure that they can focus on the important part of school, which is getting an education and not have to worry if their shoes have holes in them or if they have a winter coat. One of the fabulous parts of my job is I get to go out into the community and talk about all of the wonderful programs that IPEF uh, does and the community rises to that um, need every single time to help support our programs and enrichment programs. Uh, I put a few of them up from the last couple of months. We have been very busy on Super Bowl Sunday. I was at Northwestern with uh, about 35 of my closest new friends from Georgetown and Longwood. The Champions for Literacy program donated through the foundation $5,000 to Longwood Elementary and $5,000 to Georgetown Elementary to help with their K-3 literacy programs. Um, kudos to uh, Donna Curry and uh, Yoni Espinoza, uh, the LMC directors at Longwood and Georgetown for helping me put this together. This was a fantastic event. All of these kids got to be right out there at center court and, uh, and then got to stay for the game. So it was a really wonderful experience. 
Um, Champions for Literacy is sponsored by International Paper, and International Paper also gave us a grant this year to help us with our teacher um, innovation grants, so we are very lucky to have them as a community partner. Um, shout out to the Rotary Club of Naperville, who recently donated $5,000 to our Kid Essentials program, for, and also to our mental health supports programs. Um, they have their annual Parade of Lights every year, and we were one of the lucky 19 recipients to receive funding from that uh, fundraiser. And finally, I'd like to thank our friends at the DuPage County Board, uh, who gave us a $20,000 grant to help with our Kid Essentials program. Um, we are really, really lucky to have the support, not only of the community, but our local boards and um, politicians who work hard every day to help make sure that our kids have everything that they need. So coming up, we have uh, one of our biggest fundraisers of the year. It is a week from Friday. Uh, I'm not sleeping. <laughs> uh, we are all very busy at the foundation getting ready for our third annual Inspire Gala. Um, I have buy your tickets up there, and that is a live QR code. It is a fantastic event. Um, it is a night uh, where we get to celebrate the art and musical talent, artistic and musical talents of the students in our district. There will be art on display. There will be live music from um, some of the small groups from our high schools. Uh, we will also have food, beverages, a wine pool, and a fantastic silent auction. I put one of my silent auction items up there, this fantastic Swarovski crystal purse, which this picture is not even doing it justi justice because it sh shines and sparkles. I have five different Swarovski purses this year um, that are only made for charity events like ours. They're handmade and they are one of our signature things in the silent auction, but if you're not a purse person, hey, I'm not a purse person, and even I'm like, hey, I, I might need one of these in my life. Um, I, we have foursomes for golf, we have food packages, we have family fun packages, summer adventure packages, we have uh, jewelry, we have salon baskets, coffee, food, anything you can think of, it's in this auction, so there is absolutely something for everybody. Our silent auction goes live this Friday, and then we'll close at 9.30 p.m on the day of the event. All of the funding that we, uh, all of the income that we earn from this particular event go to fund our programs here that are for the district students and staff, including the Fine Arts Festival, free cardiac screenings for our high school students, teacher grants, all of the things that we have been talking about today, robotics clubs, all the things that we've been talking about, all of the programs that the that we sponsor here in the district, that is where this money is going. So if you can't make it to the gala itself, um, take a look online at our silent auction. I think you'll find a treasure there. Um, I have 30 tickets left for the Inspire event, and I think everybody up here is going, so I wanna tell you thank you very much for your support. Uh, we have moved this, uh, you may have noticed we have moved this event this year to right here in the heart of our district at the White Eagle Golf Club. So we're really excited to be able to have it right here um, and support our local businesses. There are a lot of ways that our, our parents and our community can make a difference right here uh, through uh, IPEF. Join us at the Inspire Gala event, which I just mentioned is Friday, March the 8th. Nominate a teacher or a staff member for the A-plus award. We all have that one special teacher that's gone above and beyond it, in this district. In my case, as a parent, far more than one. Um, but the, the idea is, is that we recognize those teachers. The teachers that don't win the A-plus award but get nominated still receive copies of their nominations, so they know how much they are appreciated and loved here in the district. Team IPEF 2024 goes live this Friday, March the 1st. Charity registration, regular registration is March 1st through April the 30th. After that, the price goes up and we don't want you to have to pay any more than you have to. Um, everyone who registers through Team IPEF does get a discount code to register for the race. So um, please join us and watch your social media and your district e-news and all of the usual places for that. 
And if you want more information on any of the programs that we run or you'd like to donate to our foundation, please visit our website at IPEF204.org. Coming up, stay tuned. I'm sure I'll be talking about this at the next time I'm here in front of the board. Uh, we have our Valley Runway project in which we give away prom dresses and tuxedos to students who would like to go to prom but might not be able to afford to go um, because they can't, uh, as we all know, prom dresses and accessories are very expensive. Um, we try to make sure that everybody gets to go who wants to go. That is our Valley Runway Project, and that is this Friday, actually. So I'm, I'm looking forward to watching the volunteers there get to play fairy godmother a little bit. Um, our last robotics tournament is uh, March the 8th and 9th. It's an elementary school robotics tournament. Uh, IPF has been sponsoring robotics since its inception 10 years ago. We piloted it, and we've been supporting it ever since. And if you've never been to a robotics tournament, it's a fantastic event. These kids are creative, innovative, and they can fix a robot on the fly like nobody's business. So um, check it out. And then finally, I would like to invite everyone to the 37th annual Fine Arts Festival, the signature event of IPEF. This is a district-wide event. Every school, every, uh, every, every high school is going to be filled to the brim with uh, music and art, and it is once again going to be a free event that is Saturday, Mar May the 18th. Um, my son's gonna be performing again, <laughs> so I'm excited to, to, to be able to listen to his music as well as the music of uh, the over 8,000 student musicians in the district, uh, and there will also be somewhere uh, approximately between 11,000 and 12,000 pieces of art on display as well. Um, special thanks to the Naperville SICA Commission for helping us um, put on this event. Finally, mark your calendars for 24-25. I know, it's a long way out. You guys are already doing your calendars for the next year, but Young Hearts for Life cardiac screenings are going to come back to our district. This is a biennial event. We only do it every other year, but we try to make sure that every high school student gets two bites at that particular apple. These heart screenings are free. IPEF does help... Uh, make sure that all of those are, are subsidized. And um, since we started doing this, my goodness, it's been uh, 15 years now. This will be our 15th year. Um, we have screened over 39,000 high schoolers. Of those 39,000 high schoolers, 408 were flagged for previously undiagnosed heart conditions. That's 408 students that averted a tragedy because of this program. If your, student has, if your high school student has not uh, taken advantage of this program, I cannot recommend it enough. Uh, you don't have to be an athlete. You don't have to be. It's, it's for everyone. Every high school student is eligible. Thank you very much for your time. And if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you. So I'll just open it up to everyone if anyone has any comments or questions. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Do our Thank students you. have any questions or comments? Victoria. Yeah. Come. yeah. Right here. She can come here. Hi. Um, thank you for the Hi, presentation. Oh, yeah. yeah. yeah that's right. Okay. So with the Student Advisory Board, we like to relay information that we find important from the district office and relay that back to students in a way, in a student-to-student -student approach so that maybe it's more um, personal. Mm -hmm. And so I was wondering, and the answer can be no, that's fine, but do you think this is information that would be important to relay to students? Because I know that a lot of students may not understand completely what this foundation does, and I think that would be really helpful if they just knew a little more from a student perspective. Absolutely, and I would be 100% available if you had questions or would like to do an interview or would like to learn more about some of our programs. Um, I don't think that there's a student who goes through this district that is not touched in some way by a program from the Indian Prairie Educational Foundation. And though I 
I often say we do a lot of quiet good in the district. It's, I agree, it's very important for students to know about this, um, especially things like the Fine Arts Festival, the heart right. screenings for, for high schoolers especially. Um, and I would be happy to talk to you about this further. Great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Yeah, I think not only do our students um, get touched by this program, but parents don't realize what their students are being touched by. They, they think it's just part of the district stuff, right? But it's really a very impactful organization in the wide variety of programming that you laid out for us tonight. So, like, and I was just, uh, you know, I. How long is your? How long has it been around? Did you say thirty? Eighty-eight. Yeah. Since nineteen eighty-eight. So a while. Um, <laughs> you know, it, it's uh, it's kind of to Victoria's point. Um, is that and, and to Miss Donahue's point, you know, I don't think there is one single student or family member or even community member that hasn't been impacted in some way from IPEF over the course of these years. Um, actually, within a course of one year, I, I think all our families are impacted, especially given the Fine Arts Festival. Um, but I, I do feel like we maybe don't do a good enough job or, you know, and this is nothing towards you, uh, Trudy, um, but I think we need to try to make people even more aware um, as much as we can. And, and maybe that does start with the students um, and bringing it to their level. I know we, we always ask the parents to give, but again, I think if students are more aware of it and how it impacts them, um, you know, then they're gonna say, hey, to their parents, you know, you know, this really helps us for whatever it is, be it robotics or, um, you know, what the case may be. But, you know, this is impacting everybody, including our staff. So, uh, just a thought. Would you like to make some comments? Yeah. Yes. Wow, this is so cool, guys. Um, <laughs> um, but I just want to say, obviously, IPF is, like, the greatest. My mom's a part of it, um, and it's really great. And there's so many opportunities that students should definitely be going out for, especially things like heart screenings. Um, I think in high school, like, you kind of just, like, don't care about a lot of this stuff. But I definitely think that's something that the Student Advisory Board needs to pay a bigger uh or place a bigger emphasis on because the fact that there's like these free heart screens is like it's incredible like the amount of people that they go through in one day and a lot of my friends got it because their parents made them but also just having that initiative to go out and do those things for yourselves and living in an area where we have the resources to be able to do those things uh and to that end also fine arts i've been part of fine arts since i was like in fourth grade which is when i first moved to the district and it's probably one of my favorite things about being part of the fine arts program at Matia Valley. Um, it's a wonderful concert program and it's just like the most fun that you can ever have. Um, and I have so many memories just surrounding it. Uh, one question I did have was about the counseling for at-risk teenagers. Is that something that requires kind of like an adult suggestion that maybe the student should be placed into it? Or is it something that a student can request help like that by themselves? That is, uh, the counseling that we do um, is recommended by administrators. And so they recommend students for that program and then they, those students do that. We, we, sponsor, um, we sponsor that program in both the middle school and the high school. So we start in the middle school trying to catch those at-risk students. Um, we bring the counselors right into the school so that the kids can do that and they don't have to worry about transportation or finding a doctor or anything. And then that expands into the high school. We do that program with, in concert with 360 Youth Services. But yes, that is something that gets recommended on an administrative level. Um, due to privacy reasons, obviously we can't, we, we, we can't discuss specifics. But yes, that is done by the school administration. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Any other comments, sir? Yeah, it's, um, IPEF is something that we all need to be uh, in eternally grateful for. $5.3 million over the span of um, its inception to now is an incredible amount of money to help our students and greatly appreciated. So. Thank you to you, Trudy, and to all the other board members and 
Yes, uh, everyone that donates and runs and does all of the things that are involved with IPEF so important and impactful. So thank yeah. you. I, I don't think people realize that you know this is I'm the only full-time employee of the foundation, and um, I have a lovely quarter-time assistant who's my development coordinator, and 17 volunteer board members who run this entire foundation. And we, we are so blessed to be able to do the work that we do and have such wonderful partners who work with us each and every day. So thank you very much. Ms. Gentz is on our representative now on the board, mm -hmm. so thank very you. Nice. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, March the 10th. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now we will have a presentation from Mr. Matt Shipley regarding the financial forecast and budget update for fiscal years 2024 through 2029. All right. All right. Good evening, members of the Board of Education. Uh, as President Donahue mentioned, tonight I'm here to present our financial forecast and budget update, uh, starting with the current fiscal year of 2024 and then projecting five years worth of forecast data through to 2029. Uh, this is the first of several Board of Ed Education updates this spring that will ultimately lead to the adoption of the fiscal year 2025 budget in August of 2024. Uh, tonight's agenda, uh, first I do want to spend a few minutes looking at our current fiscal year and just updating the board on our financial, um, financial projections for the current year. We'll then go into a forecast for the five years of operating revenues going forward, uh, move on to operating expenditures. We'll then cover our non-operating funds, so that's both our bond and interest and capital projects fund. And then finally, we'll summarize the data and talk about our next steps, again, leading up to a budget adoption in August. So as mentioned, just wanted to start by covering where we are uh, as of today for our, our current fiscal year, the fiscal year of 2024. So uh, after several years where we saw some significant variances kind of between the budget and actual as we were dealing with um, a pandemic and coming back from a pandemic and, and some significant influxes of revenue, um, some unexpected revenue sources, some unexpected expenditures, some various expenditure savings. Uh, this year is pretty much uh, online with, bu with the budget uh, really across both revenues and expenditures. So we're, we're back to sort of a normal operating environment from a financial standpoint. Um, so in general, both revenues and expenditures are in line with the budget we adopted in August. Uh, again, that was a budget of just over $423 million of revenue. Uh, and we're projecting uh, as of today that we'll finish the year with $424.6 million in revenue, or about a $1.3 million positive variance. Uh, on the expenditure side, we initially budgeted 422.7 million of expenditures. Uh, we're now projected to come in at 422, 422 million and, and just under that 700,000 number, so within $50,000 of our budgeted expenditures. And so in total, that is a, a, a positive variance of about 1.4 million. Um, I will point out that our budget in that other local category, both uh, th this was a source of, a, of some unexpected revenues last year, primarily as interest rates increased. We were seeing some significant investment income. Uh, we also saw some significant increases in our replacement tax revenue. Those were budgeted for in the current year and budgeted as kind of a one-time revenue. So uh, again, that, that's an area that's maybe higher than it's been historically, but that was already incorporated into the budget. Um, and then the second, uh, just kind of, again, slight difference, not as significant as it was in prior years, but we are running uh, a positive variance in salaries and benefits, but showing a unfavorable variance in purchase services. And again, what's, what's driving that or, or happening there is we are uh, relying on some contractual services, specifically in the special education area, uh, to cover open positions. And so we budget for those positions in salary and benefits, when we're unable to fill them, we look to fill them with contractual services. And again, that's, what, that's what's driving that difference there. So in total, those are about netting out. So as we develop our, our five-year projection for revenues, we look at a variety of, of macro uh, economic data as well as what's happening locally combined with kind of where we are year-to-date and historical data to really, really form what, what we believe is an accurate projection of revenues for the next five years. 
Um, so just want to go through through five years really quickly, but uh, with, with those same revenue sources we saw in those last, the last slides, which, which break out into really five main categories. Our property tax revenue, our other local revenues, um, state revenues coming primarily through evidence-based funding. We also have a state other category, which is primarily the three categorical payments, but also includes some smaller grants and some competitive grants we receive through the state. And finally, our federal revenue. Uh, so just, just covering kind of the, the high-level trends of this data, we'll, we'll show that property taxes continue to grow as a percentage of overall revenue. So property taxes already represent about 76% of our revenue. Over five years, we do expect that to grow up to 79%. So again, a continued growth in the reliance on local taxpayers, local property taxes as our primary revenue source. Um, and really what's, what's driving that is that our state funding is, it, we're kind of projecting it to, to, to be stable or even decline a little bit. Uh, so we show some growth in state re revenue, specifically in EBF. However, it's not sufficient to keep up with consumer price index increases or to keep up with that property tax revenue growth. And then the, the third piece to, to highlight here is just that one year decline between our current year budget and next year's budget in federal revenue. So in the current year, we budgeted about 18.7 million in federal revenue. We're now budgeting about just under 15 million for 2025 and about that amount going forward. Um, again, that's, that's the result of the expiration of ESSER based funding, that was our COVID relief funds. So we've known for several years that the, those funds were temporary. Uh, we'll cover when we talk about expenditures shortly how we've tried to, to use those funds effectively, but then also mitigate the impact of the, those funds expiring uh, going into next year. Uh, as we've, we've talked with the board a lot, specifically when we adopted the levy in November and December of this year about how our property tax levy number is, is driven, or, or calculated, excuse me, and again, the main driver of that is the consumer price index. We're entitled under the property tax extension limitation law to increase our property tax levy by CPI or 5% um, each year. Uh, so, so the 5% is effectively a cap on, on that consumer price index growth. Uh, at this time last year, we were still talking about CPI and, and its impact on, on our operations, on expenditures throughout the district. Uh, as a, a similar to, to the macroeconomic environment, the, the CPI and its impact has kind of stabilized a little bit. Um, we're still above the 2% the trend that, that we project as a long-term historical trend and is consistent with uh, what the Federal Reserve tries to set as their long-term rate. So now it's kind of a time to take a step back and say, okay, so what was maybe the long-term impact of this, this two years uh, of having some significant CPI growth? And so what we're, what we're showing here is that 5% that cap, which is what we're entitled to under PTEL, and then the actual CPI number along with that 2% that kind of floor. And what I want to show is that for two years being above that 5%, that now has a cumulative impact of, o of over $11 million. So that's $11 million that we will lose each year relative to the consumer price index going forward. So while some of the short-term challenges with CPI have, have kind of subsided, that's a long-term challenge that the district's budget will see um, going forward re really, into per um, really forever. Uh, with that said, our, our projection is for that CPI number to stabilize. Uh, 3.4% was the 2023 number that came in. Uh, we're projecting 2.5% for the next two years before it returning to that 2% long-term target. Well, while CPI drives what the district can levy, uh, you know, the, the, the impact to the individual taxpayer also depends on the individual taxpayer's wealth or their or their EAV, which is what we, we use to measure property tax wealth, as well as the wealth of the be, be a good way to see the long-term trends and what we've seen over the past 10 plus years. Uh, again, EAV compared to CPI. Um, and we start with 2011 as a base year, and, and really the reason that we're, we're using that is that was the, the height of the impact of the Great Recession. And so the, we saw some significant 
uh, changes in property value coming out of that, combined with uh, which which combined with where the CPI was, really really drove up our tax rate. So wh what this really shows is whenever the blue line is above the orange line, the blue line being CPI and the the orange line being AV, our tax rate would have increased. And then when that flips, that would have been a year that the tax rate decreased. And so I think what this what this shows is that for for a period coming out of the Great Recession, we saw our tax rate increasing. We then had several years where EAV growth was significantly higher than CPI, and we started to see that declining tax rate. And then we were in a position for, for two or three years where, where they kind of matched pretty, pretty evenly, and that's what we're projecting term. Um, change yeah <laughs> apologize uh, I, there's an over under bet on how long this goes so I don't want to start over I lose the bet. but um, but the but the one but the one th and then the one other interesting part about this is in the current year we are expecting to see a significant increase in that, that EAV even above the five percent we levied and that's a result of the quadrennial reassessment, which again we talked about in November and December. Just looking at how that data, uh, just looking at how that data translates into our actual tax rate, again you'll see that tax rate kind of ramp up, peak in 2014, a decrease, and now we've sort of stabilized our tax rate around about 5.3. Uh, we do expect it to decrease for 2023, and we'll have that final tax rate by about. I hopefully about spring break, and we'll be able to update the Board of Education then on what our 2023 tax rate is. We are estimating it at about 5.12. So I already, already mentioned just some other property tax considerations that, that we use as we, for as we build our annual forecast. Uh, first, the timing of the, that quadrennial reassessment. Uh, so we did did receive preliminary data. We don't have final data on that yet, but we expect to see a significant increase in EAV throughout the district. And we expect to see that in, in both counties, both cities, as well as across commercial, industrial, and residential <coughs> development. Uh, one impact that, that we do not think will have an impact on our budget as of yet, but we're monitoring closely, is some challenges that DuPage County is having processing property tax data associated with this reassessment. Um, the county made the decision uh, to also change systems around this time, and that has created some delays. Uh, so it's, we're hearing that our taxpayers will receive their tax bill about two weeks later than normal. That shouldn't impact us, but if, if that date goes, goes out another couple weeks, that may start impacting our ability to, to receive funds timely and, and invest the funds in a way that maximizes our investment income. Um, the other assumptions we make, we, we continue to see strong property tax collections. We expect that to continue. We are a community that's, that sees over 99.8% collections of property taxes. That is outstanding. And then the final piece that, that we use when we uh, project out our property tax revenue is the amount of new property. We are assuming approximately $40 million in new property annually. That generates about $2 million of new revenue each year. Uh, moving on to state and revenue uh, projections, uh, the, governor, the governor's budget address was last week, and so that generally provides us a pretty accurate baseline on where the final budget will end up. Uh, the state is required to adopt a final budget before the legislature ad adjourns in the spring. Last year, it took them up to the last minute, I think, it, in the end of May to finally adopt that budget. Uh, but the governor's address uh, included $350 million increase to evidence-based funding statewide a $30 million increase to the categorical grants, and then $75 million in an early childhood increase. The governor has talked um, many times over the last two years about how, how early childhood investment is a priority of his administration. Um, so while those are uh, significant dollar amounts, uh, what we're showing here in this chart is that from 2020 to 2024, we've seen that the, how those similar increases play out for Indian Prairie generally results in a pretty minimal increase in state revenue and again an increase that does not keep up with inflation. Uh, so again if you look specifically at the last uh, three years, 2022, 20, and 2023, and 2024, um, we've seen inflation of about 15% cumulatively whereas state revenues only increased for us by about 6%. 
And we actually had uh, last year, 2023, where our state revenue actually decreased despite CPI being 6.5%. So again, when we looked earlier at, at all the revenue together and talked about how property taxes has to continue to grow as a, as a source of revenue, this is really the main driver of that need. As mentioned already, uh, fiscal year 2024 is the final year of our ESSER relief funds. These provided uh, just over $4 million annually in revenue for the district. Uh, uh, Dr. Lee is, and, and his predecessor, Dr. Car uh, Doug Acarius, presented several times on how we were using those funds. Uh, so we, we are sad to see them go. Uh, we do believe that they provided valuable uh, services and met, and met needs for students throughout the district. But with that said, we have been planning for several years for this funding to expire. Um, at this time, we don't anticipate any extensions to the deadline that the funds be spent by this September 30th, and we don't anticipate any significant new federal revenue to replace this as a funding source. Uh, the other two main federal programs we receive is IDEA and Title I grants. Uh, I will note uh, we're relatively consistent in revenue on, on these between the last two years. Uh, title, we talked a lot about um, how this is tied to the census data. And, and again, the census data was also used as part of the, those ESSA relief funds. So when we talked about how you know, we felt the district received a, a relatively small portion of the ESSA relief funds relative to, to what we, uh, we experience every day as far as the student, need, student needs come up, it, it really was that poverty data that was, that was driving that. Uh, so it was a little late for the ESSER funds, but the poverty data was finally updated in spring of 2023, and this almost doubled the amount of Title I we received, uh, increased it from about 900,000 to 1.7 million. So now that that update's occurred, we don't expect to see a significant increase or, or decrease going forward, but we do expect to keep that, that about $1.7 million base of Title I funding each year. Uh, the final note here is probably the nicest way I could say that uh, we do see a direct impact or a potential direct impact on what occurs in Washington. Uh, that includes not only the presidential election that's coming up in November, but it also includes uh, things like government shutdowns and not being able to adopt a budget and uh, just sort of the general chaos that seems to be coming out of our nation's capital recently. Um, so again, really lends itself to uh, budgeting pretty conservative when we talk about these federal funds. Uh, we, you know, in, in the event of a potential shutdown, for example, um, our federal programs, we would at least for the time of the shutdown be frozen. We wouldn't be in a position where we could um, access those funds until after a budget's adopted. So again, un unfortunately, from, from what I heard driving in, that could be coming in the next week or two as well. Um, just moving on to operating expenditures then. Uh, this is that same sort of five-year uh, summary for our operating funds. Uh, really, really just want to point a few things out, uh, just looking at this in total. Uh, again, salary and benefits continue to be the largest um, expense driver at about 76% of our total expenditures. Uh, and at this time, the district can project balanced budget. So we did carry forward the revenue line from the previous uh, chart, and you will see revenues uh, generally matches expenses. There's no deficits shown on this five-year projection. Some of the key assumptions that we're using as we, we build out a five-year forecast for expenditures. The, the first uh, is our teaching FTE. Uh, so again, talking about how, how we're going to adjust to a post ESSER world, we are projecting a reduction in teaching FTE of 10, 10 teaching positions every year for the next three years. Uh, so again, the, the goal was to phase this in over three years to minimize its impact and uh, to focus the positions in a way that would not impact core classroom, core classroom teachers or class sizes. So really we are looking at sort of um, gradually stepping down some of those extra supports we've provided over the last several years, um, whether that is, um, you know, social emotional supports, um, uh, uh, various community engagement supports and, and, and different supports we were able to, to use the ESSER funds to, to, to support in our buildings, but, but again, we, we knew that there was going to be a time where we had to take, um, 
potentially eliminate those positions and, and we now are in the position where we're doing that over the next three years. I will say, with that said, we did use ESSER funds to fund a K-2 class size reduction, and as mentioned here, we are not touching those positions. So that K-2 class size reduction will continue moving forward. Uh, one, one of the drivers of, uh, and challenges in this, in this five-year forecast that, that is starting to kind of come back is uh, increases in employee health insurance. So we are projecting an 8% increase for the fiscal year 2025. Uh, and then hoping that we can approximate CPI for subsequent years. Um, we, this is in line with our experience in 2023. We, we have seen a significant increase in our health insurance expense over the past 12 months. Um, and really, this, this is a result of health care being a lagging component of CPI. And so some of the uh, expenditure challenges we were having in 2021 and 2022 with um, technology or with uh, with fuel or uh, um, electricity or commodities, as those have subsided, healthcare being a lagging indicator has sort of ramped up a little bit. Um, and then finally, you know, we, we mentioned uh, at the beginning when we looked at the current year budget, how that inter interaction between salary and benefits and contractual services. Uh, we are gonna continue to budget to fill all vacant positions. Uh, so, so you'll see those positions being budgeted as salary and benefits as opposed to contractual services. It is our hope and, it, and uh, our long-term plan to eventually be able to fill those positions through salaries and benefits again. So I just want to take a, take a quick step back and look at uh, how staffing and enrollment has sort of grown. Again, we're using that 2011-2012 period, sort of the height of the Great Recession as sort of our basis here. Um, but again, to just show how uh, this potential FTE reduction looks uh, over a 10 plus year historical period. Um, so the blue line really shows our enrollment change holding that, that 2012 year as a constant. And so if you, you look towards 2023, as um, our total enrollment has decreased by about 12% uh, over the past 12 years. At the same time, we have managed to increase our teaching FTE by a little over 2%. So we have, create, we have created a, a positive uh, a positive gap, if you will. We have been able to grow teaching positions despite the, the declining enrollment. Um, this would be the first year in fiscal year 2025. Uh, this would be about the first year in 10 years, as you can see in here, where we are actually uh, projecting an FTE reduction. So this is an area we've, we've made a lot of progress in since sort of the height of the Great Recession. Um, with that said, we know that our, our buildings are different than they were a decade ago. We know that there are more needs. Uh, we wish we were in a position to continue to fund some of these positions, but uh, this, this really is the reality at this time. Just to sort of cover some other key expenditure assumptions, uh, transportation is another area that continues to exceed the consumer price index. Uh, we are projecting an increase of about 10% in transportation expenditures for next year. Uh, that does reflect that we, we are continuing to get more efficient with our routing. Uh, as we continue to phase out some of the grandfathering that was included in the 2022-2023 uh, year boundary adjustments. So, so we are, even with some of those efficiencies, we are still projecting a 10% increase. Uh, we are asking other departments and school-based purchases to maintain a flat budget, again, so that we can um, minimize the impact to FTE and we can minimize the impact on core classroom teachers. Uh, the 2024 budget included several one-time expenditures uh, related to the ELA curriculum adoption. Uh, it was over three million to fully adopt that curriculum and we were able to, uh, again, adopt that correct curriculum in full fidelity. We were able to buy all components associated with that ELA curriculum. So that was a one-time expenditure. You, that's not budgeted for in the future. And if you look at, at our uh, supplies budget, you'll see that there is a, a fairly significant decrease between 2024 and 2025. Um, and then finally, uh, we were able to budget some capital expenditures out of operating expenditures this current year, again, funded by some one-time revenues. Uh, we are now moving all capital expenditures into the non-operating fund for fiscal year 2025. This is the, this is the chart that kind of combines both the revenues and expenditures. So these are the uh, same totals we, we saw previously. So I just want to point out um, 
a few things really quickly. Uh, first, again, in the surplus deficit line, you can see that we are projecting slight surpluses all five years. And I did want to highlight uh, our fund balance as a percentage of expenditures uh, at the end of the current budget year is projected to be just short of 40%. And again, with slight surpluses, we are still projecting that to be above 35% in fiscal year 2029. And I do want to highlight that because we're going to talk a in a little bit with the non-operating funds about, about how this could be used to, to um, assist with some of our master facility plan implementation. So, as mentioned, the district has two non-operating funds. The first is the bond and interest fund, and this is the budget for fiscal year 2024 combined with the five-year forecast for the bond and interest fund. And this is the, the first year we're able to show a column with all zeros. Uh, as you can see, this, this, this uh, forecast gets a little better every year. The payments have decreased every year over the last several years and will continue to do so until our bonds are fully paid in December 30th of 2026. Uh, we do project that when those bonds are paid in full, we would have about 1.8 million of excess fund balance that could be transferred for, to capital projects or available for operations. Uh, so that's good. It, it, again, tying to that high collection rate of property taxes we discussed earlier, all property tax collections have been sufficient to cover um, all the bond and principal and interest payments thus far. Uh, absent any other action, the bond and interest levy that funds these property tax payments would be eliminated once the bonds are repaid. The second non-operating fund is our capital projects fund. Uh, we uh, are excited to say that after this summer's work, we'll, we'll achieve a goal we set to the board about three years ago that we called our 50 for 50 goal, which was to invest $50 million to address deferred maintenance needs. So the legal budget shown here for fiscal year 2024 of $12 million uh, will be sufficient to, to achieve that goal when, when combined with the work we did in the, the fiscal year 2023 and fiscal year 2022 budget. So we actually finished that work uh, about a year ahead of schedule. Um, with that said, you can see the Capital Projects Fund is starting to uh, come to an end here. Uh, we are budgeting 13 million of capital work for fiscal year 2025, and that would leave us about $7 million in fiscal year 2026 before all we would have available for capital projects each year is just over a million dollars of annual funding. Uh, as the board knows, we passed a master. We adopted a master facility plan in December, uh, which which is pretty ambitious and calls for some significant investments throughout the district. The investments include safety and security improvements, uh, addressing infrastructure needs, both ongoing needs as well as needs we've deferred over several years. It's also addressed, uh, identified three buildings: um, Hill, Gregor, and Wabanzi, of needing comprehensive improvements just given the age and condition of those facilities. The plan also uh, set out a, a plan to modernize our learning environments or, the, or the, the actual environments that our students are in every day, as well as identified a path towards investing, investing in sustainability and reducing long-term operating costs. The total cost of this plan that we presented and, and adopted in December was um, around $800 million. It included needs that'll need. It included needs that'll be funded both upfront, uh, likely a several hundred million dollar upfront investment, as well as a, an annual component to that. Uh, again, I don't want to cover too much what we what we covered in December, but we are currently testing our funding proposals and reviewing funding proposals for the master facility plan. Uh, so I do do believe in May I'll have more information on on our uh, proposals to to fund that amount to fund that plan. Again, recognizing that there's a, there's a portion that, that we need to kind of catch up on. Again, some significant deferred needs, some safety and security pieces, as well as a need that's going to be more of an ongoing need. And so the, the final piece I just want to talk through this evening is kind of the first idea of how to fund the, the first portion of that plan. And that is really to look at that operating reserves number and transferring that into our capital projects fund to make a significant upfront investment in that master facility plan. Uh, our operating fund balance has gradually increased over the past several years. Uh, this really is due to our board and our administration's commitment to, to, to sustainable budget practices and to running uh, slight budget surpluses every year. 
Our fund balance now exceeds the state's recognition, recommendation of 25% of annual revenues. That's the percentage that's required to meet the state's recognition status. Um, and so we, we could be in a position to transfer a portion of this excess to the capital projects fund and again begin funding that master facility plan in, 20, in the summer of 2025. Um, shown below is kind of the calculation that would, that would support the amount that we could transfer. Uh, for 2025, we're budgeting about 436 million of revenues. 25% of that would be 109 million, uh, with a projected year on fund balance of 167 million dollars. We could transfer up to 58 million into the capital projects fund, and again, still have the 25% reserve that the, that would be needed to meet that state recognition status. Uh, the recognition status is one component of that calculation, but the, the second piece is to make sure that that aligns with our district cash flow. Uh, so again, fund balance is kind of a, a one-time calculation at June 30th, so, but we also have to be mindful of how that would play out through the whole year as we look at the ebbs and flows of both revenues and expenditures. Uh, so shown here is kind of our estimated cash on hand for the current year. Uh, and again, what we're really looking for before making that recommendation is where is the lowest point and will we still have a little bit of green if we took a, a you know, $50 million portion in, or so and transferred it into capital? And what we see is that we could transfer, again, up to $58 million, and we would still have about $40 million cash on hand at our lowest point, which generally occurs in uh, mid to late May, right before we receive our first property tax installment. So again, this is, this is sort of the first concept we wanted to present this evening as, as, an, as an idea that will be available to, to uh, again, partially fund that master facility plan and again, be available to, to fund and, and do some of the, that work sig significantly up front, um, potentially starting as early as summer of 2025. So with that, I am available to answer any questions that the board has. Uh, I will remind the board that uh, we have another presentation scheduled at the May Board of Education meeting. Uh, we'll continue to update the board as, as we hear any updates that are relevant to our budget and financial futures. Uh, and then, again, we will plan and work towards a legal budget adoption at the August 2024 Board of Education meeting. All right. Ms. Dumming, do you have questions? Thank you, Matt. Um, slide 12 and slide 13. I was going to ask on 12. Um, oops. Hold on just a second. Um, let's see. I was going to ask about what would happen with the, um, the FTE. And if you, on, when I look at 13, I see the gap. Do, and I did not ask this, so if you, um, beforehand, so if you need to, to get back, um, that would be fine. Do we have an idea what would happen? You talked about the K through two that would not be impacted, that we're gonna keep. Do we have any idea of impact on, um, I know it's only 10 total, any p impact on classroom um, sizes or anything, what do, what do we anticipate? Yeah, for, for, next, for next year's reduction, I, I I think I can state that classroom si class size and core classroom positions would not be impacted. Uh, I, I'm optimistic that we'll get to that position for years two and three as well. Uh, with that said, it's it, 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 it's funny because your your comment kind of you, you say it's only ten, and a, across our system you would think only ten, but but um, again, as as the board knows, we. We're already operating sort of lean and mean. We're already uh, at an operating expense lower than the state average. And so um, even just 10 uh, does involve some difficult conversations and difficult decisions. Uh, so we've, we've worked through that as an administrative team for next year, and we're continuing to have those discussions as we look forward. And part of that question was, because I kind of did want to, you, you brought up the excellent point. I wanted to remind our, um, you know, our, our district that we do um, operate at a differing, uh, you know, level of teacher uh, classroom sizes and uh, students per teachers per student. If I'm saying it correctly, um, 
so that's that was one of the reasons that that I wanted to to point that out and um, let's see Any, you talked about um, that healthcare is inflation, inflation as a lagging component of CPI. Do we anticipate? Um, I have no idea what they're, you know, what we're saying at a federal level or um, industry wise. Do they, in, does it look like that that'll probably stay where it is? Do we, do we see any impact? Because I know we've done, we had done really well with our healthcare. Yeah, side we've, we, we had, so we had several years. Uh, uh, Again, where we did where we did very well, we're starting to see that that reverse a little bit. I think there are some real challenges at a nationwide level with with healthcare. Uh, you know, it starts with an aging population. It starts with more uh, individuals um, retiring every day, going on to Medicare. Though that that Medicare program of, is effectively subsidized by private healthcare, by employee provided healthcare. Uh, you know, there, there are challenges with uh, provider access um, in, in, a, in several spaces, and so that, you know, naturally there's a supply-demand component which drives up cost when that occurs. Uh, so we're, we're seeing that locally, and we're definitely not immune to those, those national pressures. Uh, you know, locally as a district, we are um, an aging workforce. Uh, we, we have uh, a lot of employees who've, who've, again, just given the nature of, how, of our growth have have been with the district for many years, and, and as that uh, aging workforce happens, you, you tend to see more health, you know, more health care per, per employee cost. So we're, we're definitely seeing some, some pressures locally as well. Uh, you know, we, we do have great partners with both our unions uh, working through, through our health care. Uh, we are a self-insured plan, so we do have a little bit more flexibility in how we manage some of those challenges. And so uh, I'm optimistic we can, uh, we can address it and, and again do what we can to keep 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 costs as low as possible. But but there are real challenges out there. You know, um, when we look at thank you, when we look at um, you talked about staffing and enrollment as our enrollments decline, and the enrollment cliff. Do is that um, do we see even going further out that uh, it should be as we looking at it um, for years. Um, 25 to 29, relatively, relatively stable. Are we expecting, you know, to, and I don't know how far, I know this is just five, but as we right. look at um, the enrollment cliff, say five to 10 years out for us, what yeah, do we? Yeah, we, we continue to have discussions with our, um, with our dem demographer, uh, and we continue to update a lot of the enrollment work that we did um, in a comprehensive manner two years ago with the, with the boundary and enrollment analysis. So we continue to monitor it. I think what we what we uh, really see is uh, two sets of sort of uh, 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 two sorts of drivers. So on the one hand, um, you know, nationwide we have a, a again a declining birth rate. Uh, you know, individuals choosing to have less children and have them later in life. Uh, we also know at the state level, our state's population is at best stable, but potentially uh, declining and projected decline in the future. And so that, that's sort of driving a, a declining uh, trend. At the same time, we know that at Indian Prairie, we're a destination district. Uh, Naperville and Aurora are destination communities. They are great places to, to raise families. We are a great school system. So we know that, uh, to that extent, those are pressures that will keep our enrollment stable and potentially grow it. And so I think those, those kind of conflicting factors lead us to, to this projection here where We've seen a decline, but we really sort of see a floor kind of developing around that 25 to 26,000 um, student enrollment. And um, my last comment is just, you know, as I look at um, slide 14 and talking about, uh, you know, the opportunities and transfer of operating revenues, um, I'm certain there'll be some other questions, but just, you know, thank you for the um, making sure paying attention because we do have so many still we've done some great work um, facilities wise but still as you've already indicated you know our aging ba buildings so um, thank you for looking and finding ways for us to try and find where um, we can help some transfer occur to address some of the, the challenges that we continue to have and uh, we'll continue to be 
interested as we move forward in, in looking at and talking about um, presenting different ideas. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Krubus. Thank you. I, I stayed awake through all of it, so I'd, I'd like a big pat on the back. Um, two points. Uh, the Illinois evidence-based funding formula is, uh, is totally failing us. Uh, this Illinois' investment in education um, is failing all districts in Illinois. Um, and then more extreme, all Tier 2, Tier 3, and Tier 4 districts. Um, from an overall perspective, the formula was set in 2017, um, and the mandatory funding was $350 million, um, but that wasn't adjusted for inflation at all. And so we're going to have $350 million paid for decades, and we're going to keep falling behind, so they're going to keep putting in less effective money. Um, they're going to put keep putting in smaller amounts of money relative to 2017. Um, so 350 million sounds like a lot, but it should be 420 million if we were to just adjust it for inflation. And I'm using you know, estimated numbers. Um, so Illinois is failing to fully fund, um, fully invest in its state education um, across all districts. In particular on our district, if you look at the numbers, and I know you, you mentioned it, but um, slide nine talks about historically our EBF funding numbers, and I'm going to talk in round numbers. In 2020, we got 40 million. 2021, we got 40 million. In 2022, we got 41. In 2023, we got 41. And in 2024, we got 42. So you can see there's not a lot of growth in the state's EBF funding. Um, on a year-over-year -year basis. And some of those numbers are 0.8% growth. I mean, once you start calculating it out, it gets, you know, it gets ridiculously small. That was our historic numbers. You know, looking at kind of our current projected numbers, going to slide four, state EBF numbers, 42, 43, 43, 44, 45, 45. You could see we're not getting a large investment from the state on this uh, funding formula. Um, so it's, it's failing the whole district as a state. Um, and it's not just, it, it's our Illinois State Board of Education that's making these recommendations that they, they should continue to fund at $350 million. So it's not just, you know, the governor, it's not just the, you know, the legislatures. Our governing body is, is also making this recommendation to basically um, each year continue to fall backwards in its state funding across the state. Um, going back to my second point is I'm, I'm very, I've been a very strong advocate for the facilities and deferred maintenance and needing to catch up. Um, but I'm, I'm hesitant on the transfer because um, I think we I would want to get a greater understanding of the forecast. Um, you know, a five-year forecast always has less certainty than a three-year forecast. Uh, but what worries me is slide 17, where we're going to start rolling off our capital funds, capital projects fund is going to go to zero. But then we roll back into our budget on slide is it 11? No. One slide. Yeah, our expenditure budget on slide 15. If we look at that same year, we don't have a line for deferred maintenance. We don't have a line for capital spending. But in effect, we're going to have to spend money out of our operating funds to pay for that. And so taking $10 million out of our projected spend in 2026 is going to significantly reduce our projected year end and fund balances going forward. So I, I get a little nervous about forecasting out that far without 
merging the non-operating funds into our operating funds. And I know it's not you know, the state formula on how you're supposed to look at the budget, but from a practical standpoint, we're still gonna have to pay for the roofs. Um, and if we don't have another funding source, the state's not gonna save us with EBF and we're gonna have to take it out of the operating funds. And so we're gonna need to spend significant effort to see if we can get a different funding source. So uh, saying all that, thanks for your time. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Jane. Matt, thank you again for such a comprehensive overview of our, our financial health and for breaking it down for people like me in a way that I, that I can understand. I, I truly appreciate that. Um, it, it is hard to keep hearing our increased reliance on um, local, uh, local revenue um, as board member Krubus just discussed. Uh, I think it's interesting that we had this presentation after the foundation spoke because, again, we're kind of heavily relying also on the foundation to provide these enriched programs uh, because uh, we, we, we are not getting the proper funding from our state. Um, so I, I, I think um, you painted a, a great picture for us on, on what's going on and what we're dealing with. Uh, to echo board member Deming's questions, I understand why despite decreased enrollment and increase of our faculty, our staff, our teachers, um, mm -hmm. we are not able to reduce class sizes yet. Um, and I hope there will come a point where we will be able to do that beyond K through two. And I know that's something the board is, um, committed to trying to make happen as well as um, the cabinet and, and the leaders in the district. So uh, I just, I don't really have any questions. I'm looking forward to the, May, to the May update about the master facility plan and learning more about that. Um, but otherwise, thank you again for such a great overview. Ms. Gunts. Thank you, I just wanna echo everyone's sentiments. Thank you very much, Matt. For, for the very comprehensive um, presentation. Um, I, I really don't have any questions. I was going to um, echo board member Krubus's sentiments where um, it, it is frustrating when we keep seeing, you know, that the governor is, it, it so, again, sounds great. He's giving, you know, so much more money to education, but you know, as a district, as we can all see, we're not, we're not really going to be benefiting a ton from it. Um, and to echo just board member Jane, uh, we are looking, I know, to keep reducing class sizes, but then we're also talking about, you know, having to get rid of 10 FTEs, you know, over the next several years. So, uh, you know, I, I think that, you know, you did a good job of saying, you know, the ESSER funds are gone. I mean, we're losing a lot of, you know, extra funding and we're not getting a lot more from the state. So. I think it's just, it, it's good that as a district, you are really trying to actually have our money go towards facility, you know, the facility projects. And we do have a lot of work to catch up on for all of the schools. So um, I don't have a question. I just wanna make sure, you know, everyone at home is kind of able to understand this too in the easiest way that we do rely so heavily on, um, taxes, local taxes, um, and that will not change. So um, again, thank you. I do look forward to kind of hearing from you in May to see what, you know, how everything's looking. I know right now a lot of it's kind of, it's projections and conjecture even just for the next year or two. So thank you. Thank you. Mr. Rising. You can go to slide four. Um, so just to put this in perspective for our community, um, I've talked to each individual board member. Our property taxes are high um, and it's frustrating. And we don't like our property taxes being high either, just like our community doesn't. 
Um, but here's what the community can do. The community can tell the state to fund education, public education better. Because if public education was funded better, our property taxes wouldn't be as high because the majority of our property taxes are public schools. Now, we don't complain that loud because we have wonderful schools. I, I, I get that part. But when you look at this slide four and you see that 75% plus of our revenue comes from local property taxes, which in the next five years is gonna, is gonna go up to 78.9%, and you see our state funding is currently at 10%, and it's gonna go down to 9.5% in five years, that's a problem. And I say that's a problem because I've looked at other states. Other states are getting funded by the state upwards of close to 40%. We are getting 10%. Let that sink in for a while, because that's a major issue. Now, if you go to slide seven really quick, one positive here is what the district and the boards of education had, have been able to do since the Great Recession. Our property tax rate at the height of that was over 6%, and now it's down you know, 5.3%. So the fact that we were able to lower the property tax rate on our residents since the Great Recession is pretty commendable for our community. Um, Here's the interesting, uh, the irony of that though. The areas that have less local property wealth, their tax rates are even higher than our tax rates. The districts that have high local property wealth, their tax rates are lower than our tax rates. So it is a messed up system, but what I can tell you is our community should be calling on our legislators to fund more money for public education. Um, taking you back for a couple seconds, back in 2000, spring of 2017 to spring of 2018, District 204 had a parent community, local leaders, students all come together for a project called Engage 204. Um, it was, the Board of Education at that time said, bring all the people together and let's look at the priorities of District 204 because our funding was very low at that point. There were 20 things that the community laid out that they wanted accomplished and prioritized. Fast forward six years, we've accomplished 17 of the 20. What we haven't been able to accomplish yet is class sizes, which we mentioned. Um, but that's extremely hard if we don't have the revenue to lower those class sizes. The other things were facility improvements and safety and security. Um, we have not been able to put as much money into those areas as we would like. We were able to do some things like air conditioning and those type of things. But that is, those are the three areas that unless we get significant funding into our district, that we will struggle to accomplish. And it was further enhanced by the facility study plan that we did that this is gonna take us close to 10 years now. Um, and then just my last point, slide 18, um, transferring of the operating reserves. Um, I, I'm a little bit with Mr. Karubas on this that I, I need to understand a little more closely how this may impact us. Um, where I get nervous about this is, you know, my 13 years on board, the Board of Education has always tried to not raise our reserves because the Board of Education has always felt if you raise your reserves, you're taking advantage of the property taxpayers. And there are districts, some neighboring districts that have upwards of 70, 80% of reserves. District 204 only has 25% of their revenue in reserves. So we are at the minimum or what the state says that we should keep at that rate at. So 
I just get nervous by taking some of those reserves while I think some of it may be necessary for, for, for facilities and, and, and operating, but I get nervous transferring out that out of there unless I can have an understanding how that might impact us long term because it's always been my understanding that building up those reserves, it's easy to transfer, but building them back up, it takes a, a significant time. And I don't know if you could just comment on that. Yeah, that, that's, it, it's, it's, a val it's a valid concern. Uh, it, again, we would, we would never recommend um, budgeting, uh, spending the reserves on operating items or spending them on uh, recurring expenditures. So that's not the, 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 uh, that's not the intention. The intention is is for it to be a one-time use and and for something in the uh, towards the the master facility plan or towards capital. And I and I think that that speaks to that challenge where if you've spent it down on operating, then at at some point those monies th those funds are gone, and now you you have a structural deficit. Uh, it, it, you're correct. It would be a challenge to, to to rebuild those reserves. Again, this would be potentially used towards capital, knowing as as Board Member Krubus mentioned earlier, there's also going to be recurring capital cost associated with our master facility plan. Uh, so, so I think those are all valid um, comments and concerns, and we can a, a administration can do more to to refine this this proposal. We just wanted to show this as a concept tonight, as I do think it's going to be. Uh, some component of, of a master facility plan funding proposal. Uh, I, to, to counter it a little bit, if, if the money's used wisely, it could be used in a way that reduces uh, annual operating expenditures. Uh, it could be used in a way that, um, again, whether that's, uh, you know, efficiencies from a heating cooling perspective, uh, whether that's um, building in some sustainability into our to our energy um, you know wh whether that's uh, doing some of the roof replacements that are really needed to uh, engage with solar and, and look at that as a as a uh, potential solution uh, whether that's just reducing annual repairs and maintenance on on equipment you know we're spending over two million dollars a year just on repairing and maintaining equipment that's probably already well past due whether that's um, you know, patching leaky roofs, or uh, you know, fixing uh, fixing leaks that that are occurring, uh, in uh, like we had at Nico over Thanksgiving. So, there's opportunities to use it in a way that uh, that do ge that do generate lo operating savings, and, and would again potentially solve some of the concerns on the operating side, or or partially address some of the concerns on the operating side. And then the the other piece is that. Uh, from an inflationary standpoint, the, the cost of that master facility plan is going to continue to grow. Uh, so the sooner we can start addressing some of it, when, um, again, potentially as early as summer of 2025, that will ultimately keep the cost of that plan as, as low as possible. So uh, uh, but appre appreciate the feedback, and we'll, we'll continue to work to kind of refine this, this proposal. And, and again, I, I do think a, a, a use of fund balance is going to be a portion of, of funding the master facility plan. Thanks, Matt. And there's three different people dragged down their mic at the same time on the other side, so we'll. Thank it's dumbing. You. <laughs> Thank you. Already down to one. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one thing I forgot to, to point out on um, slide 14, we where we talk about other expender assumptions, we've had so much co um, conversation and communication regarding transportation. And that bullet one, transportation costs exceeding CPI and a projected increase of 10%. I just wanted to point out that that's why it's so critical for us to ensure that some of the um, studies that are done, that we make sure and ensure that we are in a, a position to receive that state funding that, um, for those areas that can uh, truly receive transportation. And it's, it's just it's yeah, that, critical. Yeah, that, that's a great point, and it speaks to some of the, the comments uh, as well about the state um, coming, coming short of their, their funding requirement. Uh, we talked a lot about EBF. Uh, but one of the three categoricals that the state funds is transportation. And in theory, the state it has said that they, they fund that at 80%, but by the time they operate transportation, the funding comes in closer to, to 50%. And so uh, 
you know, a 10 percent increase combined with the, the state funding staying at or, or potentially decreasing for that categorical means that that full increase is really being being pushed to the district. And, and, and why we, you know, why we have to take so, take a, such a careful look at every single route because if we're providing transportation in areas where we can't receive even that percentage, that puts us behind even more. Yeah, so yeah that, that transportation uh, claim is a, is a very detailed claim that's subject to state audit and if we were not in compliance with uh, the, the guidelines on, on state transportation, again, the one and a half miles that we use as a district is based on that state requirement, uh, we would potentially jeopardize that funding completely. So, so that, is, that is something that we are very cognizant of when we review our transportation program. Okay. Mr. Kurvis. I want to jump back in here real quick. Uh, slide 18. We go back to um, the state recommended 25% of annual revenue. Um, and we've always maintained that while I was on the board. But that's really an arbitrary number that they put out there. And we don't get um, more revenue by maintaining that. We just kind of get a gold star that says, yeah, you maintain that. I think the, the key point is on the next slide, slide 19, is what's your low point? Can you make salary in May? And I, I've been on the board long enough where we had like a couple weeks on there and you know, are we gonna, are we gonna make payroll? So I appreciate seeing th that even with the revised low point, we still have plenty of reserves based on our calculation to, uh, make sure that we operate without having to borrow money to get to payroll. So right. thank you for that. Yeah. No, you're, you're welcome. And the, the next stage of this, this potential recommendation would to model the low points out over a longer term horizon to, to confirm that that relationship stays. But again, at least the, our, our cash flow is relatively consistent between years, so at least conceptually showing this, this one year uh, sh should, should speak to that. Okay, thank you. Good questions and comments from everyone. Um, on slide 14, you know, often we get asked about um, cost reduction, and it, we're very careful at looking at our head account, how we're spending our facilities money, all of these things. But if you look even at slide 14, the second bullet, flat budget for departments and school-based purchases. So if you have a CPI that's increasing, you're basically asking people to do more with less. And I think that that's a common theme of what goes on in our district with us counting every single dollar and penny to make sure we're putting it towards the right resources to help our students. So um, on slide 15, so when you talk about um, the fund balance of 25%, are we currently at 30, 36? Yeah, we're, uh, we're currently just short of 40% for mm -hmm. the current budget year. Uh, and then th this projection would keep us in that, that range of between 35 and 39% and for the, the five years of the projection. And this is, again, not assuming that the, uh, the potential transfer that was introduced uh, right. with the capital projects piece. So how, what is the lowest percentage? Have we been below 25% before? Uh, I'm not aware of a time we were below 25%. Okay. It, it's uh, it, at least not in recent memory. Uh, again, to board member Karubis's point that the 25% is based on that state recommendation. Uh, if we looked at our cash flow perspective and what would be a, a number that where we would potentially run into issues with uh, um, maintaining positive cash flow throughout the year, it would be about a 17% number. So that 25% does give us a little cushion of, you know, the, the real bare minimum uh, low point. And there, there are districts that uh, go below that number that do issue short-term borrowing each year to, to, make, to make sort of those April and May payrolls. Uh, I, am, I, I, I will never recommend that to our board. Uh, uh, and again, that speaks to some of what Board Member Rising mentioned earlier where you know, once you once you get into that point, it, it becomes very difficult to to ever get out of it. And there was one time for um, some IT purchases that we did go into the fund balances um, when we were around 25, 26 ish percent. Um, 
but it was kind of one of those one-time purchase things and you know we had to kind of get that technology at the time and um, you know but it's good that we've built up that fund balance a little bit to, to have that flexibility I mean we always um, planned for the ESSER funding to go away so we were careful with the way we spent that money but I also know that some of those resources have um, given valuable um, support in our district and so I know that um, looking at that uh, um, fund balance, you could decide that maybe we need some more of that versus some capital expenditure. So it's a, it is a really difficult question that um, you know we need to carefully look at. And honestly, I, I get nervous about having our fund balance drop below a certain point. I, I mean, at the time I've been on the board, I think it's always been around the area it's at right now for for us. But um, also on slide 17, where we're talking about our capital outlay and um, you see what's forecast in 2027 20, and um, beyond. And what was the, when we had that um, facility study done before where it um, studied how much maintenance we should typically do in a typical year that we're all now trying to catch on, up on because in previous years we only put in, you know, 3 million or 4 million or whatever. That number was like 9 million a year, wasn't it? Yeah, and we, uh, again, as part of our master facility plan, we, we would envision about 10 to, to 15 million dollars of work annually it. after we catch up and do some of the, the the other required upgrades that we've identified right so it's uh, this is i mean this would be putting us back into the deep hole if we went with with this kind of forecast in the out years so it's it's really not where we want to return to and that's why we have the 50 million dollar program we've had uh, over the last couple of years to try and make up for all of that um, expense that we didn't um, lay out for roofs and the parking lots and schools and things. So it's like, um, we, I think we have to really um, be careful with you know what we want to see happening in our district. And that's it, a balance between the um, head count in our schools and the facilities plans uh, and also our fund balance. So it's like, uh, you know, you made me worried when you talked about, you know, the federal instability right now. And I remember back in you know, early days when our state was very unstable. And so we weren't sure if we were going to get payments or not. And so, you know, $350 million is not the greatest, but at least it's been kind of consistent. And who knows, though, going forward what, what that might turn into. Yeah, as, as much as we have... Uh, and, and I think rightfully so have, have been critical of, of EBF. I think there is there is that that pause to say, well, what was before it? And uh, with EBF, there there is that sort of hold harmless pr provision, so you know you're at least getting what you got right. the prior year. And uh, the state has made a commitment to fund that timely. And by that being kind of the 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 primary funding source and being funded primary um, timely, that that has made a big um, difference in, in cash flow and, and being able to, to budget and, and predict the, the, the flow of those state payments. So that has been a, um, again, some would say it's the bare minimum we should be expecting from our state, uh, but that has been a, an improvement over, over the prior funding models. Yeah. Now, it is disappointing, too, to see that we're not going to have a picture where we're less dependent on local funding sources, as many of the board members have echoed. and. You know, I think we all, um, as taxpayers that live in the district, also would love to see that, but the reality is that's not going to happen. And uh, I, um, you know, I share everyone's frustration with that and um, want to see that change, but it's not going to happen. <laughs> um, but thank you very much for the information and always, always a lot to think about. So thank you. Yep, thank you. Okay, next up we have legislative advocacy and Board of Education updates. Um, we have a few updates. We had a couple members go to the uh, national convention uh, this past weekend, Thursday through Sunday, and get some more 
professional learning and uh, insight on what's going on in other boards around the country. So, um, <clears throat> I think that uh, we had an opportunity to attend, um, board member Jane and I had an opportunity to attend the COSBA conference uh, this past uh, few days and a couple things that were really uh, seem to be tenants that people continued to speak about in presentations. Um, one of the big ones uh, was just taking a look at uh, legislative policy at the federal level and I, I think that's probably always something that we're always going to be concerned about but um, just being able to plan uh, a little difficult as uh, the as uh, um, Mr. Shipley already spoke about the little inconsistency with uh, being able to have decisions being made, but but hopefully, um, you know, past the election, maybe that will that will hopefully change a little bit. But um, then the other thing within the most of the uh, many of the conversations uh, centered around um, just technology and the growth of, uh, of um, AI, I'll let um, Member Jane speak a little bit more on that, but uh, it's not, not going away and just very, um, we have to make sure that we're looking at those opportunities for AI for our overall district students, um, administration, as well as teachers, the good, and then we know that there's some challenges, but how do we make sure that our children are prepared to handle, our students are prepared to handle those challenges and making sure that they can, um, that we're teaching them so that they can take advantage of the positive things that, uh, that it brings as well. So, um, Board Member Zhang. Um, I'm grateful for the opportunity to uh, represent our district with uh, Board Member Deming at our National School Board Conference that was held in Dallas, Texas. Uh, the national conference was attended by members from 30 states, um, and it's an incredible opportunity to speak with other school board members from across the nation and learn from them, but also be reminded um, how lucky we are to be in the district we are in and to be functioning uh, the way we are. So uh, some of the sessions, um, that I and board member Deming attended uh, were around the subject matters of how to develop executive functioning in preschool students. Very fascinating, and, and um, I believe some of that work is already being done in our district. We attended a, an incredibly interesting uh, session on absenteeism. Um, learned a lot about what's happening at the national level, and it seems to echo what's happening in our district as well. And um, board member Deming's question about the having multiple year calendar was, I think, in part due to that session as um, uh, parents like to plan ahead of time with their vacation, and it might help with absenteeism. And then, of course, there, what was very interesting to me was a series of um, sessions on AI. and. Uh, as board member Deming stated, it's here to stay, whether we like it or not. But what is fascinating to hear is um, the good, the possibilities with it in terms of not just from a student perspective, but from the teacher perspective, from the administrator perspective, from all perspectives. So that was fascinating, as well as to hear about, um, as they termed it, the bad and the ugly. Um, and so just becoming more knowledgeable about it as well as developing policies at the district level. Um, hopefully we'll see something from the state of Illinois around policy development. Um, that's something I know board member Domingue was going to inquire more about. Um, but overall, again, a very exciting place to be, to learn, to grow, and to be reminded uh, how wonderful our district is and I know I, I, I'm I'm obviously biased but it's, uh, uh, just if I, I take my board member hat off and a parent hat off and a community member hat off and just look and hear what some of these other districts and states are struggling with um, I, I'm grateful I'm, I'm grateful for 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 this district and and the people that belong to it so that's about it
Okay, um, I did attend the LEN session. I was a couple minutes late, but I got there. Um, I'll send out the slides if they don't send them out directly, um, but there were a number of bills that were discussed and um, actions that they're pursuing. Um, for IASB, they are asking if um, boards have any uh, ideas for sessions to propose for this fall conference. And so we had several that were um, discussed um, and thrown out as ideas around communications, like some of the things, our strengths around communications, governance, like updating and repeating the governance uh, presentation we did, what's that, two years ago? Yeah. Um, uh, possibly doing something around our superintendent evaluation, which Dr. Talley loves so much. <laughs> It's very comprehensive. Yeah. yeah. And then um, also a possible one about uh, the work that we did around boundaries, like how to bring in the community and how to, you know, what to look at and how to handle transportation and those types of things. So I was looking for anyone ideas or if we want to offer one up or two I mean I suppose we could send in two if we wanted I mean I would be willing to write up one on the boundaries if if that was of interest to people that was one of the reasons that I thought about that is the uh, surrounding the, the communication that we really used as we looked at boundaries, I think it's a very difficult, that subject is always very difficult for a variety of districts um, whenever you undertake it as, as it was for us, but um, I like the process that we used as far as keeping uh, involved with the community around every particular aspect, and so that's, that's where I really thought about communication initially, although we've uh, continued to have it in a variety of ways, so there might be some ways to combine that um, with uh, with the boundary discussion. And I would add to that package maybe a description about board norms because two years ago when we presented, I know there was a lot of folks out there that really appreciated learning about our board norms and that you had shared some documentation with, right? right. Um, and, and that could be also board norms with regard to the communication in the community, because I think that might be a nice package. Anyway. So any, I, mean, I like the idea of the governance update too, but maybe, maybe wait one more year for that to repeat it. I don't know. The, the only thing I, <clears throat> I think commu communication ideas are good. Um, I'm not saying no to the boundary thing, but you also have to remember that it's not a, not every, not every district is looking to do boundaries or will ever be doing boundaries. So it may not be that relevant to the majority of the districts that are attending the conference. Um, just something to keep in mind. Um, you know, because I, I remember when I was part of the deciding committee of, of reviewing, I don't know, like 150 different presentations, um, there was some, if I didn't have that mindset of, are the majority of the districts gonna benefit from this, I kind of said, eh, not really, you know? And so, uh, again, just something to think about, but maybe, maybe the boundary is part of a communication presentation. It, you know, and that could be all encompassing as, as far as, you know, what we went through with COVID, with, with the boundaries, with the strategic plan, with, you know, the facilities plan. I mean, it could be a bunch of things as it relates to communication, but then those are different pieces within the presentation. So just a thought. Okay. How about I'll draft up something and then people can look at it. And let, I mean, unless someone wants to submit the governance one again, I mean, I don't see a problem with submitting two either. So I don't know, Mark, if you. 
Yeah, what's it to Friday? Yeah, the first. Yeah, we don't have a lot of. But time. it's just a. It's if I remember correctly, it's just a sheet. Yeah. Of the title. Yeah. And our district. Like up here. Yeah. Yeah. So we we've got time to create. Right. right. Um. I think not. Not sure when she's coming yeah, back. Huh? <laughs> yeah, that's a good one too. Yeah. Um. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you and I maybe talk? Okay. Together. All right, well, well, whatever we come up with, we'll pass it by everyone for any comments or whatever. And I don't, I mean, I don't see harm in turning in more than one, but yeah. 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 So, all right. I need a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Okay, we are adjourned.